We have a special guest with us uh, today. Uh, I did not know that Laura Ng existed until uh, late September uh, when I went to rep our uh, denominations reason, uh, region at a uh, installation service of a new pastor at the First Chinese Baptist Church of San Francisco. Do you remember that day? Some of you might remember because I was dressed up that day and that never happens. And if you remember, I, I, uh, I was even talking about I, I, that was one of the rare occasions I wear my fancy robe and put on my stole. And on that special occasion, I made sure to wear my Charles Darwin socks uh, just to be a little defiant uh, in that Baptist setting. Well, anyway, I ended up sitting next to Lauren and uh, found out uh, pretty soon that she and I um, share a similar heritage. Uh, her dad and my dad uh, were big deals in our denomination. And then upon further reflection, because my wife's dad also was a, uh, a regional minister, um, <laughs> I realized that you also had the same vacation schedule as Lynn and I did, which is following the, the big conventions of the denomination around the country. So we actually uh, share that together as well. Um, I was really impressed with Lauren when I heard about her role with American Baptist Home Mission Society, which is everything our denomination is doing uh, within our borders. And, uh, you know, because of some of the things we've been through, I uh, wasn't sure how excited I'd be about anything denominational, uh, but when she was sharing with me some of uh, the things that are bubbling up uh, made me very, very encouraged. So Lauren, uh, to me, has been a breath of hope uh, in an otherwise uh, kind of murky uh, space in history right now. I know you're going to be super impressed. She did a great job in the first service. Don't blow it, people. The first service is really with her, all right? So make sure you are with her all the way. Lauren, come on up. Let's uh, welcome Lauren to the stage. Thank you, Pete, and thanks. That was, I'd say that was up to par with the first service, so great job. Um, it's so good to be with you today. Uh, Pete and I, like he said, met last September, and ever since um, then, I've just been really excited and looking forward to finally being here with Crosswalk. Uh, the way your pastor speaks about you is the way uh, somebody speaks about someone they love deeply. And so um, I can see why, and um, again, it's just good to be here. So thanks for having me. Um, we'll get into the scripture that I'm going to be preaching from in a second, but I, I want to start by telling you first that uh, I was a very courageous child. Um, my mom loves to tell the story of me as a two-year-old in the middle of the department store on a busy weekend shopping day, and I had caught a whiff of someone who had chosen to let one go. And suddenly there I was, you can imagine my little two-year-old self, standing defiantly with my hands on my hips and yelling in an accusatory tone, okay, who farted? <laughs> Apparently, I was first introduced to my love of hot sauce as a toddler when my parents frantically screamed for me sitting in my high chair to put down the crusted red cap of the Tabasco bottle. Legend says that I smirked at their lack of confidence, licked my lips, and went for it. And not a single tear fell. I used to skateboard off of a DIY half pipe that my big brother and I constructed in our backyard. I challenged his friends to Nintendo tournaments. Little did they know that under my grade school facade, I was a Tetris master and a total gaming shark. I asked a boy who was way out of my league to the eighth grade dance, I figured, what the heck? He said no. <laughs> and when all the other girls chose to do their science classification project on flowers, could you get any more boring than that, I chose entomology instead and ruthlessly captured insects, pinning them to my foam core display. I was a courageous child. Things haven't been quite so easy in the courage department since then, and I think you probably know what I mean. Puberty hits, adolescence, and then identity crises all the way through adulthood. You may choose to marry someone, and then it dawns on you that that means actually loving them every day, no matter what. Jobs come and go, maybe kids, certainly bills, addictions, diseases and dis-ease, falling offs and falling outs, the state of the country, and certainly the woes of the world. 
Jesus talked about this kind of thing in my early 30s when anxiety started to get the better of me. In fact, I would say that worry and anxiety was my addiction. I added another life verse to my quiver, Matthew 6, 25 to 27. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? So see, Jesus confronted our worry while also modeling courage. Today we're going to take a look at the courageous Christ and see what we can glean from his example. Now, I heard that you've all been studying the book of John, and I don't know if you know this, but your pastor Pete is a biblical scholar of this gospel, which is somewhat intimidating for me. <laughs> but I wanted to keep you in your flow, so I decided we would go for it. So. Today's scripture comes from chapter 5 of the Gospel of John, and I'm going to read about 1 to 23, verses 1 through 23. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew, Bethzatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man who was there had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jew said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, The one who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making, thereby making himself equal to God. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. The father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be astonished. Indeed, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whomever he wishes. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. May God bless the reading of God's word. So chapter 5 tells the story of Jesus healing a man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. Now, people would lie around this pool throughout those five porticos, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, with the belief that when the waters stirred, angels were transforming it to possess the power to heal them. Now, some people, some scholars will argue that the water stirred only once a day, causing the man to say, whenever I try to get in the water to be healed, somebody else goes down ahead of me because someone else was always faster than he was, and they stole the miracle out from under him. 
Other biblical scholars believe it was the man's words that led to the interpretation of a once-a-day miracle, but that in fact the, the waters were always ready to heal, and the man was more the victim of his own hopelessness than anything else. Jesus says to this man who's been suffering from his ailment for 38 years, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And instantly, the man picks up his mat and walks. And I love what the author does here. The author of the gospel has waited until this moment to give context as to just how controversial this move by Jesus really is. So he decides now to tell us that all of this is happening on the Sabbath. Unlike a conventional narrative, a conventional story that would have begun with the setting first before letting the action unfold, the author actually gives us the action and then fills us in on the setting. It's as if he's emphasizing just how courageous Jesus is being in this moment. Jesus heals because he is the one who has come to heal. The setting doesn't really matter. No day of rest will get in the way of what Jesus has come to do. And so his identity is foremost, and the context is secondary. So here we have the first lesson in courage from this story. And that is to be courageous in your identity. I was picking up my kids at school the other day, and a mom who I see from time to time asked me what I do for a living. She noticed that I travel quite a bit, I'm not often there for pickup, and she was curious. So not knowing her context for faith or religion, I simply responded, I'm a Baptist minister. This normally warm, personable woman suddenly wore a look of sheer horror on her face. She quite literally took a step back from me before collecting herself and then said, Wow, I wasn't expecting that. I guess you won't be liking me much anymore. I have a gay brother. After assuring her that I did indeed still like her and that my faith compels me to not only love but affirm her brother for who he is and whom he loves, she calmed down and her warm demeanor sort of returned. But that night, I recounted the story to my husband, and I thought about whether or not to drop the word Baptist when telling people what I do. Perhaps that word, with all of its stigma, stigma and baggage, really wasn't doing me any favors in the first impressions department. And perhaps I should respond with something more innocuous like, I'm a pastor, or I'm a spiritual leader, or even, I'm in the nonprofit sector. <laughs> but as quickly as the idea came into my head, I dismissed it. See, I am theologically, socially, and unabashedly Baptist. I believe firmly in Baptist principles like soul freedom, the, the freedom to interpret scripture, the separation of church and state, the priesthood of all believers that we are all anointed and baptism for those spiritually mature enough to claim their own belief for themselves. I am proud of my American Baptist heritage and the ways we've consistently stood on the side of history that arcs boldly towards justice. Now, are Baptists perfect? Of course not. But I do refuse to allow my Baptist identity to be clouded or misrepresented by those whose words and deeds are contrary to those of Jesus, but who wave the banner of Baptist. They don't speak for me. And so in an attempt to be courageous in my identity, I think I'm going to continue introducing myself as a Baptist minister. So in what ways do you need to be courageous in your identity? Jason did a great job of being courageous about who he is this morning. How are you to be courageous in your personal life, as your, in your identity as a Christian, as a congregation here at Crosswalk? Jesus says in Matthew 4, is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. So be courageous in your identity. Believe in who God says you are. 
A second lesson we can learn from this story. Be courageous about whom you serve. Now, Jesus seems to choose a pretty unlikely candidate for healing on that day in Jerusalem. This man is not known as one of the shining stars among those healed by Jesus in the Gospels. In his defense, the woman at the well, some of you may know that story, the woman at the well who graces the previous chapter in John 4 is sort of a hard act to follow. When Jesus asked her if she wanted to drink the water that would cause her to never be thirsty again, she immediately replies with faith that he is capable of delivering on his offer. And she replies, sir, give me this water, please, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to this well to draw water. But in contrast, when Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well, he replies with what some read as an excuse or a wallowing in self-pity. And he says, sir, I, I have no one to help me into this pool. And somebody always beats me to it. When Jesus reveals to the woman at the well that he is the Messiah, she immediately hurries off to tell others in her town that she has met the Savior of the world. In contrast, when Jesus heals the man by the pool, he simply picks up his mat and goes. He doesn't tell others until he's confronted by leaders demanding to know why it is he's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. So the man seems like an unlikely candidate for Jesus' healings because from what we're told in the story, at least, he doesn't seem all that impressed or grateful or even transformed by his experience. But Jesus did have a thing for showing compassion to others regardless of who they are what their standing was, or what effect it would have on their own well-being, on his own well-being. So Jesus most certainly knew that healing the man on the Sabbath would put him in a bit of trouble with the authorities, but he didn't let that deter him. He was courageous about whom he served. It was the summer after my second year in seminary, and I thought I was going to be a hospital chaplain. I was enrolled in a summer program at the Alta Bates Medical Center in Oakland, uh, completing three units of what they call cl clinical pastoral education as a chaplain intern. So the five interns, we had to take turns being on call for a 12-hour overnight shift, and we slept on a rollout bed in the chaplaincy office with our beeper close by. It was around 2 a.m. on my very first on-call shift that my beeper went off. I called the nurse's station, and I was asked to come in. Code blue in the maternity ward. I threw on my rumpled work clothes and headed over. Upon check-in at the nurse's station, I learned that the code blue had turned to what the hospital calls a fetal demise. The baby had only made it to 24 weeks, and he was in the hospital room with his parents and extended family. By now, I was pretty nervous only keeping it together with the help of pure adrenaline. Okay, I told myself, I've been sort of trained for this. And then the nurse said, and the family's Catholic, and they want the baby to be baptized before they say goodbye. So my anxiety increased as I walked up to the patient room door. And one more thing, said the nurse as my hand was positioned on the door handle. They only speak Spanish. Now, I have felt the palpable, incarnational presence of the Holy Spirit a handful of times in my life. This was one of those times. Somehow, in a way only God could explain or be the explanation for, I comforted that family, dedicated their little boy lying motionless in his mother's arms, prayed and recited scripture, all at 2 a.m., and with a rusty recollection of my years taking intermediate Spanish in high school. But by the end of our time together, I was embracing the parents and their baby boy, the tios and the tias, the primos and the primas, the abuelos and abuelas, and we were all in tears, every single one of us. No logical or reasonable assessment of that situation would have ever led me into that hospital room. But I prayed to God to give me the courage to serve that family despite my obvious shortcomings. And God honored that request. 
So be courageous about whom you serve. You are already doing that here at Crosswalk, whether it's the homeless, the displaced, the disenfranchised, the immigrant, the rejected, or the other. You are serving courageously in Christ's footsteps. Continue to think about who else you will be courageous enough to serve, because God will undoubtedly meet you with your hand positioned on that door, and the Spirit will enter that room with you. A final lesson we can learn from this story. Be courageous about who sent you. When the Jewish leaders confronted Jesus for healing this man on the Sabbath, he replied, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And later Jesus says, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. And this perturbed the leaders for a couple of reasons. One, Jesus was breaking the Sabbath by healing someone. And two, by calling God his Father, Jesus was equating himself with God. But the scriptures continuously remind us to point to the one who sent us. In 1 Samuel 17, David says to Goliath, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. First Chronicles 16.29 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And in John 12, on the occasion of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the crowds waved their palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Last fall, I was in San Jose attending the annual meeting of the Evergreen Association, which is one of the American Baptist regions here on the West Coast. And upon arrival, I learned that several of the attendees who had to fly in for the meeting had been reassigned to a new hotel. They had originally been booked at the Marriott, but in an act of solidarity and support for the Marriott workers who were on strike that month, demanding higher pay, more job security, and smaller workloads, the Evergreen Association had chosen to house their attendees elsewhere. So that afternoon, when the annual meeting was on break, several of the attendees walked over to the Marriott to join the hotel workers in their march. Reverend Liliana Devale, pastor of the San Jose Church, who was hosting that meeting, announced to the hotel workers that they were there to support them in their efforts because Christ Jesus came for the least of these, because Christ Jesus pursued justice and mercy, because Christ Jesus instructs us to love our neighbors. Our American Baptist sisters and brothers exhibited courage that day, and they did so in the name of the Lord who had sent them. Now, we all know that these days it's not always flattering to identify as a Christ follower. But when we remain silent about in whose name we serve, we give way to others who will use God's name for harm, and we shortchange God for the things that are indeed of God's heart, limiting his renown throughout the earth. So we have to stand in the way of people who will co-opt God's name and falsely claim that their acts of bigotry Hatred, fear, dominance, and exclusion point to our Lord, the Savior of the world. And at the same time, we must identify the bright spots where people are working together for the good of the whole, where peace and reconciliation, reparation, communication, inclusion, and compassion reign. And we need to show up in the name of God who has sent us. So be courageous about who sent you so that the God of light and love will be honored and glorified. And when people ask you why you do what you do, don't be ashamed to tell them you do it in the name of Jesus. One of my favorite um, quotes from C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is the conversation that's had between Susan and Mr. Beaver. And Mr. Beaver says to Susan about Aslan, who is the lion that C.S. Lewis arguably uh, uses as a metaphor for Jesus. And Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? 
I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Be courageous in your identity. Be courageous about whom you serve. Be courageous about who sent you. Choosing to follow Christ has always taken courage, and today is no exception. The world longs for the message that Jesus brings, and we have been called to share it. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. So may we claim our identity in him, may we serve all whom he puts in our path, and may we be bold in declaring him as the one who has sent us. Amen. So let's... Uh... Uh, have a time of prayer together, and then we'll invite Jason to come and lead us in uh, one last song. Let's pray together. So God, as we have heard uh, this um, rich, rich story, uh, may we be uh, encouraged, truly. <laughs> may we have more courage in who we are uh, because of who you are. Uh, may we give up some of the labels that we put on ourselves, the limitations, may we remember whose image it is in which we're made. And God, help us remember who we're serving. And I love how Lauren uh, challenged us to be aware of the difference between um, people who claim uh, to be speaking in your name and yet uh, nothing in their words, their language, or their behavior seems to suggest it, and our world needs somebody who knows you and is willing to stand and proclaim uh, who you are. So God, give us courage in who it is we serve, and give us courage in who it is uh, that is sending us into the world. Uh, as lonely as it may be, God, our world desperately needs to be loved more. So may we be individually and collectively uh, that body uh, that shows and displays that courage that points to the one uh, who has shown us the way. Uh, be with us, God, in that effort. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>